don't necessarily have to think we're going to just majorly impress him with giving him stuff. Uh, stuff is a lot bigger thing to us than it ever is to him. But he does want our hearts. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brad Morrow. Uh, have the privilege of being one of the elders here. And, and I have to say that I just love this fellowship. I love Pastor Andrew and Marissa and their heart for this city and their desire just to love on people. I know very few people that have a heart as pure as, uh, as theirs. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're wonderful. And uh, I also want to just acknowledge that that little baby cry you hear there, that little fuss is one that I'm extremely proud of. Uh, I, I got a great surprise this morning and that my kids and their kids are here. And so you're going to hear a little bit about uh, more about that in, uh, in this message this morning. But we are currently in a series entitled Experiencing God. And the, the idea behind that, it's based on a book written by Henry Blackaby by that same title. And he's a uh, Canadian, uh, actually had ministered in Canada for some time. I don't know if he originates in Canada, if he is a Canadian by birth. Uh, doesn't matter, but he has, has written a book entitled Experiencing God, and uh, the, the overarching principle, the idea behind that is to identify where God is working and then participate with him in what he's doing. So often we try to do things on our own, we get a great idea, and we think, I'm going to do this great thing for God, and so we launch off into it, and very quickly it comes to nothing. It can be a lot of work to try and gin something like that up or, or get it going. You put lots of effort and ener energy into it and, it, and it comes to nothing. Uh, Henry Blackaby suggests that we become sensitive to God, give ourselves to God, and then look at what God is doing, find out where he's working, get real good at recognizing the activity of God, and then jump in with him. Uh, we all love to be on a winning team, wouldn't you agree? Uh, no, nobody loves to join a losing team, and uh, God is winning. He's never lost a battle. He's still winning today. I love that about him. He is a winner, uh, the winner of winners, and uh, he wants to make you a winner. So I want to direct you today to the scripture, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You heard this last week. Pastor Andrew did a fabulous job about... Uh, uh, helping us move from self-centeredness to other-centeredness and God-centeredness, uh, where, where his, his uh, priority becomes our priority. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Would you just join me in a moment of prayer? Lord Jesus, this morning we come to you and just pray over your word. I thank you that it's life to those who find it. It's health to all their flesh. Thank you, Jesus, that you're watching over your word to perform it, that your word does not return void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which it is sent. And so this morning I pray that you'd cause your word to be living and active, in our lives, would you touch us in the areas that we need to be touched? Speak to us in the areas that we need to adjust. Give us ears to hear this morning what the Spirit of God says to the church. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to receive what you have for us today, to drink it in, and to uh, take steps to do what's necessary in order to align ourselves with you with your purpose for our life, to align ourselves with your word, to truly glorify you. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. So Paul, uh, the apostle, says to the Roman church, he says, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, present your body as a living sacrifice. And when Pastor Andrew asked me to uh, preach this morning, he said, that this is, this is the overarching verse, but you can go anywhere you want with that. Well, I didn't get very far uh, because as I looked into that verse, I realized that uh, presenting your body as a living sacrifice to God is really step one in walking with God. 
And uh, we always talk, on a, talk about giving your heart to Jesus. Well, it's true, you need to do that. Uh, and that's very, very important. But your heart beats in your body. And uh, uh, your spirit and your soul are also in there. We're, we're just a few things I want to review about uh, your body. First of all, your body is created in the image of God. It's, uh, when you think about it, your body is an absolutely amazing creation of God. Your body is the highest form of creation. Uh, so in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are talking among themselves, and they said, let us create man in our image. And uh, so it says, and God created uh, man in his image, male and female, he created them. So just as a matter of accuracy this morning, let me just say to you, and this is, this is probably more relevant today than it's ever been, let there be no confusion, there are two genders, male and female. God created them male and female. That's all, two, two. Too. Uh, and and uh, we are a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. And uh, you can't do something to one of those parts without affecting the other two. And so we are created by God as a spiritual being in a physical body equipped with a mind, will, and emotions, self-awareness, and the power of choice. And uh, I, I have to tell you, as life goes on, I've, I've got a few years on most of you, but as life goes on, things happen that create an even greater awareness of uh, how our bodies are made in the image of God. Not so long ago, my wife and I were blessed with two grandbabies. And Zach, if you have a picture, right there, right there is the, the joy and the treasure of my heart. These are uh, the two first additions to the next generation of our family. On your left is, is Rory Joy, and on your right is Vivian May. And uh, Vivian looks like she's deep in contemplation there with her, with her hand on her chin. But it's interesting, when these girls showed up, uh, of course, speculation starts right away. Oh, she looks like her dad. Oh, she looks like her mom. I think this looks like Ashley. I think this looks like Katie. I think... I don't know. I mean, they look like babies to me, but according to the scriptures, they look like God. They're made in the image of God. And as I hold these little babies, which is incidentally the greatest job in the whole wide world, no matter what they deposit on you or over you, even if they make you have to wash your shirt a couple times a day, uh, just love these little babies. Okay, Zach, you can, you can take that down now. And incidentally, they're here in person. I, I love that. Thank you, uh, family, for coming today. But I, I'm mindful as I look into these little faces and I hold these little bodies that these are true creations of God. No human could do that, even though they are the product of two humans coming together uh, in, with their bodies coming together. It is God who, I mean, a woman can give birth, but it's God who gives life. And uh, as you hold these babies, it's kind of, it's, it's somewhat similar to holding a handful of seeds. Uh, somebody said you can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. And uh, you look into the faces of these beautiful little girls and it just, it staggers my mind to begin to contemplate all that God wants to do through them. And so my prayer for them is that Jesus put your hand on these girls and never take it off. Just protect them. Give them wisdom for the age in which they're going to live. Give them direction and purpose so they'll always know how they're going to serve God in their generation, how they're going to serve their generation in the will of God and cause them to be always dedicated to you. And uh, my wife and I pray that frequently for them. Uh, they're growing up in a different age and a different society, society than I did for sure and even than their parents did for sure. Of all that God created, human beings are the only, the only ones made with the capacity and the ability to have a living, loving relationship with the living God. 
Uh, the Bible says that creation declares the glory of God. It's true. And uh, man, when I look at nature, uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm a truck driver for a living. And as I go up and down the road, I drive at night. And so I get to see nightfall and I get to see daybreak uh, five days a week. And as I see that, if you're not familiar with uh, nightfall and daybreak, the, the thing that's most interesting is that that's when a lot of nature moves. If the deer are going to move, a lot of times they are out moving at, uh, toward nightfall. You'll see them out in the field and whatever. You don't see them as much in the middle of the day. Um, but I, I get to observe nature and the beauty of nature and just how creative God is and how multifaceted he is and, and uh, fascinating just the animal kingdom and how they work and their senses and, and all of that. It's just, and they're so beautiful to look at. Uh, sometimes drive by and see a bald eagle on the sign. Uh, it, it can be a dangerous thing because I can get a little distracted with the, the eagle and forget where the road is. Uh, but I have to say that God is just ultimately creative and just creates astounding beauty. So he creates all these animals and, and a lot of living things, but of all the living things, mankind is the only one that has the capacity to, ha to know him in relationship, in a living, loving, lasting, ongoing relationship. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, I, I, I love the fact that God made us triune beings. When I, again, look into th the faces of my grandchildren, I, I see the glory of God. I see the fact that there's a, you know, th these are people. These are little people, but they're people. They have a soul and a spirit that can relate to God. God's spirit can speak to their spirit, and there's no, no age limit on that. So uh, when, we, when we pray over our babies, uh, they can receive things that they can't even articulate yet. It's beautiful. I love that. Um, so why... Why does Paul the Apostle say to the Romans, I, I urge you in view of God's mercy, present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. What's the big deal with our bodies? The truth is, is our body is a big deal to God. Uh, as I get older, it's becoming a bigger deal to God, uh, much to my chagrin. I, I have to be, I used to be able to eat anything, anytime, and it never affected me. Uh, now it seems like what I eat kind of sticks with me, and I have to be very careful uh, that, I, that I don't overdo it. And uh, when we have great celebration meals, it seems like many of our celebrations are around food. It becomes increasingly difficult to uh, make that sacrifice. But said all that to say that your body is so central to everything that God wants to do. It's so central to your service to God and to humanity around you. Think about it. I, I, may, I use my body to make a living. I use my body to serve the needs of my family. I uh, actually use my body to get the rest of me around, my soul and my spirit. We travel together. <clears throat> it's my goal to keep those together as long as possible. The definition of death is the separation of so your soul and your spirit from your body. And so... Your body is very central. Uh, if, if you want to find out how important your body is to your existence here on the earth, to, to your life and your service to God, just leave it behind sometime. Can you imagine if I called my employer and said, I'm actually at work right now? You just don't see me because I left my body behind. They might say, you actually think you have a job right now, but you really don't. Uh, if I said to my wife, would love to help you with the dishes or cutting the lawn, uh, I'm there in spirit. Is that helping her? Absolutely not. If all of you this morning would have said, you know what, I really feel my body would really rather lay in bed, I'll just be there in spirit. What would that do for you? Wouldn't do anything for us. Wouldn't do anything for me. I, I'm telling you, I'm, I just want to say thank you for coming to church today in bodily form. It's important that you're here. We must be present to win. And uh, it's, it's such a big deal to God that uh, 
Not only did he give you a body that bears his image, but when he appeared to man, he appeared in bodily form. As a matter of fact, when Jesus came to the earth, he could have come as several things, but he came in a physical body. When he comes to the earth again, he's coming in a physical body. Your body is a big, big deal to God. So therefore, what you do with your body is a big deal to God. In the Roman society, in Roman culture, they were super smart people. If you asked any of them, they would tell you how advanced they were. And they had all manner of things going on in Rome amongst the, the Roman society. And of course, as Romans got saved, as they placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they became citizens of the kingdom of heaven, not just of Rome. And so they had to unlearn a few things and learn a few things as they started this process of being conformed to the image of, of Christ and of living to the glory of God. One of the things that was going on in Rome was temple shrines where they were, there was prostitution going on. Part of their act of worship was to engage with temple prostitutes. Um, not only is that like Mondo Bizarro, but it's a serious misuse of your body. God is not glorified in that at all. And uh, because God created our physical bodies, he made, remember, two genders, male and female. He made males for females and females for males. They, they go together. And, uh, and from that bodily union, the human race is perpetuated. And I uh, don't want to just reduce this to a biology lesson. I just want to say that that whole thing that I just described is extremely sacred to God. It's honorable to God. Matter of fact, going back to Genesis, when God said, uh, when he created man and woman, male and female, immediately he said, fill the earth and subdue it. Go forth and multiply. That's God's deal. That's what he loves. He's glorified in that. And so if you have a, uh, and so he, he, he made sex. If you didn't know that God made sex, he's not intimidated by that. He doesn't think it's dirty. He thinks it's wonderful. But just like, he, oh, easy now. Uh, he, he, he said, uh, uh, he created that. He said, go forth and multiply. He said that to the man and the woman. He said that in the context of marriage, of their union, their marriage union that he sanctioned and, and that he honored. And so... Uh, in our house, we have a fireplace. Love the fireplace. We're coming into the season where that is becoming more and more a, a central thing that I enjoy. And when it's cold outside, I just love to stand in front of the fireplace and just let the heat kind of just thaw me out just right to the core. And uh, uh, I just love that heat, heat radiating through me. And so that fire is something that I warm by. That fire is something that I sanctioned. I actually helped put that fireplace in. I paid for it. Uh, I think it's wonderful, and I very much enjoy it. Now, if I took that fire, uh, and it got out of the firebox, the fireplace that it's intended, and it got out into the middle of the front room and started burning, then it's a good thing that's in a bad context, and it threatens to destroy. Sexual union outside of marriage, same thing. Uh, and actually anything that we do with our bodies that's not honoring to God is, uh, is, is the same thing. For instance, eating is a beautiful thing. God created food for our enjoyment, and we thank him for it, and he uses it to nourish us. But if we overeat, if we overdo it, if we just do eat whatever we want to eat whenever we want to eat it, like we're on a perpetual cruise, uh, we're going to have a cruise physique and eventually, our body will uh, exhibit problems that will keep us from being able to uh, be effective to serve the Lord. And so, 
your, your body and what you do to it is extremely, extremely important to God. He's, he's watching. He cares about it. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be strong. He wants you to be qualified to serve the Lord. He ultimately wants you uh, to live forever. Now, these physical bodies that, you know, we, we understand that if un, unless we're raptured and we go to be with Jesus, uh, we will all, we're not going to get out of here alive. We will die. Our soul and our spirit are separated from our body. Our body is, goes, we, we, it returns to dust from which it was created, and the soul goes to God. Uh, if we're rightly related with him, we spend eternity with him forever and ever and ever. And so, uh, God's, God's watching. He's deeply concerned. He loves when you use your body to glorify God. And uh, the reason I'm making such a big deal of this is that it's, I, I just want you to, to understand the importance. It's God's heartbeat to watch, just like as I watch these young mothers take care of these little babies. Man, they are right. That baby makes a peep. The mom's ears twitch a little bit. They're just right on it. They're watching. And much of what they do with their babies is related to their body. They take care of their body. They also look into their eyes and speak into their spirit, which I love to watch and see. Uh, so there's the total development of that child from day to day. But a lot of what they do involves their body. Moms use their bodies to care for these babies' bodies so that they can grow in uh, favor and in stature and, and uh, wisdom, in favor with God and man, just like Jesus did. Uh, in 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, it says, uh, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Uh, Paul is, again, addressing the Corinthians in a society that was rampant with things that people were giving their bodies to destructive things. And he's, he's saying to the Corinthian Christians, you, you belong to God. You're different. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, the Holy Spirit lives in you. If you belong to Christ, the Holy Spirit lives there. When you look in the mirror, how does the Holy Spirit's house look? And uh, I remember when I was in college, uh, I was a RA for part of the time, and I uh, was doing room check to make sure everybody was in for the night, and one kid was absent. He just left a sticky note on the door, said, be back in 20 minutes. I've gone to remodel the temple. He, he went to work out or to exercise. I was thinking, now that's creative right there. Uh, and and uh, sometimes the temple needs remodeling. The Bible says clearly that uh, bodily exercise profits little, but that little really is a whole lot. And I'm not saying you should all join the gym. Uh, I don't belong to a gym, simply don't have time to do that, but I walk around the block and do an awful lot. And uh, uh, I, I'm here to tell you that whatever you do to invest in your body, whether you brush your teeth, uh, you know, you, you take a shower once in a while so that, that people enjoy being around you, uh, and so on and so forth. Take care of your body. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It matters to God. Uh, it's not an object to obsess over. It's not something to worship or idolize, but by all means, take care of it. In 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9, 27, Paul the Apostle is talking about, uh, and again, he's, he's in a society that was crazy about sports. Sports were everything. These people competed in, like, Olympics, what, what we would call the Olympics today. Uh, that was a big deal. And so there was a lot of obsession with bodily worship and bodily form and all of that. And he said, uh, you know, we, we run. Uh, in, in, a, in a race, you, you, people run in races to win a prize, but he said, I'm running for an eternal prize. And uh, he says in, in verse 27, I, no, I beat my body. I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We want to keep our eyes on the prize of being connected with Jesus, not just today, but forever and ever. 
At the end of this race, we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so what you do with your body matters. It really matters. What you give your body to really matters. What you put in your body really matters. Um, and, and what you involve your body in really matters. I remember VBS as a little kid. We went to a Methodist church. Honestly, I went to VBS for the Oreo cookies and the, and the cherry Kool-Aid. Amen, sister. That's, that's what I enjoyed. I mean, that's why I went and wanted to go back because I could have at, at snack time, I remember Oreo cookies and, and the cherry Kool-Aid. Uh, just sugar them up. I mean, it was kind of weird. We're in a church where you're supposed to glorify God with your body and we're ODing on sugar. Uh, however, uh, you do what you know, and we didn't, we didn't know any better. And, and, of course, the people that ran the VBS know that honey attracts more flies than vinegar, and so if we want kids, it's probably going to involve a little bit of sugar. But I remember singing a song in VBS that went something like this. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. And then we'd go on. How many remember that song? Anybody remember that one? Okay. Uh, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. So, uh, I mean, we, we'd sing it until we couldn't think of any other bodily parts to sing about. And, uh, but, the, but still a good song today, a great guide in submitting your body to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some of you know the name Jack Hayford. He pastored a church for many years in Van Nuys, California. It was called the Church on the Way. And uh, he said that one of the things that he learned in his life to keep him qualified to preach the gospel, one of the things that kept him qualified was, he said, whenever I got the chance, I'd vote against myself. I'd vote against myself. I heard that and I thought, hmm, what does that mean? He went on to explain that voting against yourself is in keeping with Jesus' command to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And uh, he, he was wanting to be sensitive to God in that, and so he, he said, any time I got the chance, I would deny myself. If there was a question as to whether I needed to fast a day or eat, he said, I'd always choose fasting. Now, he said, I, you know, obviously I ate. He was a skinny guy, uh, but obviously he, he ate. He didn't fast all the time, but he said, if ever there was a, even an inkling in my, in my spirit that I needed to fast about something, he said, I'd always choose to deny myself and, and fast, skip the meal and spend time with God. And he, he said, the key to my staying qualified was to vote against myself. You know, as well as I do, that we have these desires. We see things that kind of just get a hold of us and pull us in, uh, in, in a particular direction. Um, and so whether it's see, you, something you see on the store shelf or on the TV screen or on the restaurant menu or whatever, something like, oh, man, I, that would be so good. Um, and, and then you have this little conversation inside of you that says... Uh, I love cheesecake. I hate this cheesecake. I love, you know, and if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings, the, the little uh, thing going on with Gollum there where he just has a, a, a little um, battle within himself. We, we can love things or hate them. Uh, we just need to be very conscious of, of what's going on. Jack Hayford said, I vote against myself to stay qualified. Paul said, I beat my body. Uh, and, and I make it my slave so that after preaching, I don't become disqualified. Uh, I remember an old timer that was in a, a former church that uh, I was part of. And uh, he, he was actually kind of weird, but he had some fabulous wisdom from time to time. Um, and I remember one time, I, I, they called him Grandpa, and so I, he came in and I said... Uh, well, what do you know today, Grandpa? And he looked at me and he said, be true to your teeth or they'll be false to you. I thought, you know what? I can't argue with that. 
That's very true. Uh, that has stuck with me. He, he only said it one time, but man, it landed and it landed hard. And I thought that's, uh, that's wisdom right there. I've, I've looked in the mirror while I'm brushing my teeth and I hear grandpa's voice saying that. Be true to your teeth or they'll be false to you. It matters. It matters to God what you do with your body. As you steward your body well, as you take care of your body, as you involve your body in right things that you know honor God, as you avoid things that you know dishonor God, you are honoring your body, uh, you're, you're honoring your commitment to God, you're honoring God with your body is what I'm trying to say. So he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Huge difference between a living sacrifice in a dead sacrifice. If you have read through the Old Testament at all, you understand that there is a sacrificial system. And uh, the whole reason behind that was, the idea behind that was the shedding of innocent blood to cover the sins of an individual. And so these innocent animals, they'd, they'd lay their hands on their head in, a, in an, a symbolic act of transferring the guilt from the human to the, uh, to the animal. And uh, one animal they'd let loose, another one they would slaughter. And so this sacrifice, that was a dead sacrifice that completely dismantled the animal. And in some of these ceremonies, man, it, was, uh, it had to look like a butchering plant because hundreds and hundreds of animals were sacrificed at, at one time. And so some, some of the jobs of these priests was just flat out bloody. And uh, they would smell a lot like a butcher because blood and animal stuff all over them as they were cutting these animals apart and offering them to God. All those animals were dead sacrifices. They were killed and sacrificed to God. In the Old Testament system, that was pleasing to God. In the New Testament system, Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He died once for all. He became the ultimate sacrifice, and that's the reason we don't sacrifice animals anymore. When we read of animal sacrifice, we understand that's, that's, a, that's a satanic ritual. ritual. Uh, that, that's nothing that we have to be involved in because Jesus Christ is the sacrifice once and for all forever. He's the living sacrifice. He died and rose again, uh, conquered death. Paul says... Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. The difference between a dead and a living sacrifice is that the dead sacrifice is a one-time deal. Living, a living sacrifice is ongoing and continual. And uh, I'm here to tell you, some days it would just be easier to die for Jesus that day than it is to live for Him in an ongoing... I mean, if you, if you have the greatest day of your life, and you get to the end of the day and say, God, I've glorified you to the best of my ability. I don't, in reviewing everything about this day, I don't think I've sinned one time. I just want to say thank you and glory to God. Tomorrow's another day and we start over. And you don't know what you're going to encounter. You don't know how you're going to do, what tests you're going to be faced with, any of that. We do know that God is faithful and that he helps us to decide, to deny ourselves, and to choose him, to offer our bodies a living sacrifice. So yesterday ended last night, for better or for worse. Today is a new day, and God asks us to not only choose, but to keep choosing. This afternoon, Andrew Bergren and Kaya Lundy are going to be united in marriage. They have chosen to get married, to join their lives together, and uh, if you go to that wedding, you will find that they are both their bodies are there. And their bodies will come together to consummate that marriage. And they will devote the use of their bodies to serving one another to make that marriage work. Today, they're choosing to get married. Tomorrow, they need to keep choosing to stay married. Today, you can choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Tomorrow, you need to keep choosing to serve the Lord. That is how it works. And that's the essence of a living sacrifice, to keep choosing what you chose to serve Jesus. So he says, present your bodies 
to the Lord uh, as a living sacrifice. It's your spiritual service of worship. He goes on to say uh, that, that that's how you prove, that gets you in position to prove the will of God. He says in, in Romans uh, 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Um, that is also a very big deal because this world just by its very nature loves to draw you in and press you in to its system. And as a Christian, you're probably never going to fit into this world system. You will do very well to settle it in your heart today that you're not going to fit in. Do you know that God gave you a fingerprint that's all your own? He gave you an eye print that's all your own. Your iris is unlike any others, and, and there's facial recognition software that just can look at your eye and know that it's you. God gave you a voice print that is your very own. You've heard that before. It's true. And so he made you an individual. Isn't it interesting that human nature always wants to be like somebody else? We want to be different just like somebody else. And we want to fit in. If you look at the, the, the young culture, the teen culture of any generation, what did they do? They wanted to fit in. They do things that they know they should not do because they want to fit in. Settle the matter today that you're, you're never really going to fit in. Somebody once said normal, normal, whatever that is, is just a setting on your dryer. It, it's, it's not made for you. You weren't made to be normal. God didn't create you and redeem you so that you could be normal. Part of the beauty of this body is that every one of you is different. You came here as an individual to be a part of something far greater. If you look at our physical bodies, there's a lot of different parts that all function together. We would be a freak of nature if all of our body parts were the same thing. It wouldn't be a body. It would, we, we'd just be a thumb or an eye or whatever. The beauty of the body is all the different parts that aren't afraid to be individuals functioning together. It's what happens when the body of Christ comes together. You're different. You're alone. You're uh, not, not alone as in lonely, but you're separate in how God made you, and yet you are a, a part when you come and you bring your uniqueness offered to God as a part of this body, it becomes a functioning, beautiful, living organism that brings glory to God. And so I, I have to say I'm grateful for the body of Christ. I'm so grateful. Uh, this morning, I, I, uh, my wife and I were talking, and I just went over and just gave her a hug. I did that not so I could tell you I gave her a hug. I did that because I love hugs, and I used my body to do that and wrapped my arms around her, and she wrapped her arms around me. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see the body function like, like, it's, like it's meant to function. When you come to church or any time you participate as a, a member of the body of Christ, it's like receiving a hug. You get something that you could not get any other way. And uh, so just, just realize that uh, you, you're not made to conform to this world. God made you an individual. What he says for you to do, what he directs you in, may be different than somebody else. And uh, the reality is, is that he wants you to be a part of a greater body, but he, he sees you as an individual. And he works in your life. He speaks directly to you. He has a plan for your life that's unique and marvelous and beautiful. Um, do not be conformed to this world. There's, there's so much of what this world has to offer and, and begs you to participate in that is not life. It's not life-giving. Uh, the, the shiny things that many people chase after, not only don't glorify God. They, there's just no life in it. The more things I have, uh, you know, the older you get, the more, uh, perhaps one of the greatest gifts that God has given me as I continue on in age 
is the gift of perspective. Some of the things that I thought I wanted as a young person simply have faded away. It's like, that was worthless. Uh, and so the more things I have, the more physical possessions or material possessions I have, the more I find that they kind of weigh me down. You know, it is nice to have a house to live in just because I hate freezing. I love to get in out of the cold and in some cases out of the heat. Um, but I found out that becoming a homeowner requires maintenance. And there's these things called taxes you have to pay. And then in the event that it should burn down or blow away, you have to be covered with insurance. So even if the house is paid for, there's still bills that I have to pay just to live there to maintain the thing. Plus, there's lawns to mow and flowers to water and uh, stuff to paint and stuff to clean and on and on and on and on and on and on it goes. Am I thankful for it? Yes. Is there life in it? That it helps sustain life, but that's not where the life is. It's not in owning things or possessing things. There's a reason why Jesus just stayed at the house of friends and didn't have a house himself. He, he, was, he was fully devoted to just investing in the lives of people. And so if you find yourself in a position where you have things that are sucking the life out of you, just put a for sale sign on them or give them away and get, get free from that. Um, and, and take that advice within, within reason. Don't be radical about it. I'm just saying that uh, God wants you to have life. He said even when a man... Uh, possesses a lot of things. His life doesn't consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. So don't be conformed to this world. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I said earlier in this message that you cannot do one thing to part of your being without affecting the other two, body, soul, and spirit. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That can even have a healthy effect on your body. It's amazing how that works, but they're all tied together. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, the uh, Pharisees came to Jesus, and they were, they were squabbling about some things that uh, had to do with eternity and who would be married to who, and Jesus looked right at him and said this. He said, you people are in error because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. There's a key right there for us. And that is if we get to know the scriptures and we get to know the power of God, we will be far better positioned to know the will of God. For the Christian, the big question is, what's the will of God for my life? Anybody here ever struggled with that? Ever asked that question? The truth is you'll know the will of God for your life in every moment when you get to know the scriptures and the power of God. And so if you are a Christian, if you've given your life to the Lord Jesus, um, you need to be in the scriptures frequently, daily. They're more available now than they have ever, ever been. If you don't like the physical book form, uh, they're available to you electronically. Um, you can find, you, you can download the the version app on your phone, if you don't have a phone that you can download that on. Uh, if you have a home computer, you can go up on the web. If you don't have that, uh, there's scriptures available in just about any form. Um, you can listen to them. I listen to the scriptures. I, I try to make that every single day that I listen to the scriptures. Listen through the Bible in a year just so I don't forget it. And then as God speaks to me through a particular passage, spend some time on that, digest it, re, you know, rehash it, re review it, get it into your soul. Um, Jesus said, you err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. They have a transformative effect. They will speak to your life and they will bring life to your situation. They'll guide you and direct you and help you to know the will of God. They'll make you sensitive to the Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, as you memorize the Scripture and as you become familiar with it, you give the Holy Spirit who lives in you 
a file cabinet to use that he can just open the drawer and pull out a file, hold up a cue card and say, and speak that word to you again. You will never go wrong filling up on the word of God, getting to know the word of God, studying the word of God, memorizing the word of God. And so uh, it's, as I prayed at the beginning of this message, it's life to those who find it, it's health to all their flesh. His word never returns without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent. If you want to live a fruitful Christian life, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Agree with what God says about you. We sang the song, I am who he says I am. How do we know who he says I am? By, by learning and knowing the scriptures. So they go all the way back to the beginning of this message and experiencing God. And how do we know the will of God? How do we become sensitive to him? And how do we learn to look for where he's working so we can join him? It starts with presenting your body as, as a living sacrifice to him. Not being conformed to this world. You don't have to be weird, but if you live as a Christian in this world today, uh, people will probably ask you, why do you do what you do? Or why do you not do what you do? That's a wonderful question to have somebody ask you, and it's a, gr a great opportunity to uh, just testify of, of why you do. And so, uh, don't be conformed to this world and then to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I'd like to just close in prayer, and I'd like every one of you to join me just in prayer right now. If uh, uh, somebody wants to come uh, part of the worship team and and uh, do some music here, you can do that while we pray. I uh, just want you to join me in prayer because I believe every one of you is here today by divine appointment. It's no accident that you showed up. You came because God wanted you to hear what I told you today. And he wants you to be a fruitful Christian. He wants you to experience God. He wants you to be able to identify where he's working and join him in that. And so I'd like you to join me in prayer in these three areas. Just pray with me in your heart as I pray out loud, Lord Jesus, this morning, I recognize that you came to save me. I pray that you'd set my heart in right relationship with you. Grant me repentance for the things uh, wherein I have failed you. Help me to be rightly related to you, first of all. Forgive my sin and set me in right relationship with you. Please be my Lord and Savior. Secondly, Lord, I pray that you'd receive this sacrifice, this living sacrifice. This morning I decide just to present my body to you as a, a living, ongoing offering. I offer all of my faculties to you. Would you sanctify my eyes, my brain, my mouth, my heart, my hands, my feet. Lord, your command is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind. That involves our body. And so, Lord, would you help us to obey that command? To give ourselves completely to you, not just today, but every day. Help us, Lord, not to be conformed to this world, not to worry about what's going on with anybody else, but to realize you made us an individual and you might have us walk a different way than somebody else. You might have us deny ourselves and just not be involved in some things that other people, even Christians, seem to be involved in and, and are fine with. Lord, help us to hear your voice and to do what you say. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, would you continue your transformation process? Would you please help us to apply ourselves to the scriptures, to get the word of God, to get into the word of God and get the word of God into us so that we would know the word of God, so we would know what you say about how we should live, what we should do in each situation. Would you sensitize us to you, oh God? Please help us to know you from the inside out to serve you with all of our being 
to glorify you with our bodies and all of us to be all in till it's all over for your honor and for your glory please receive our sacrifice Jesus today and every day in Jesus name amen and amen amen we uh, we have a prayer team that will be in the back corner there if you need individual prayer for anything they'd love to agree with you because God answers prayer we've seen it in this church and we know it um, if you're a guest today and you haven't registered at the at the welcome center uh, we, we'd love to have you do that just as a record of your visit we don't want to obligate you to anything here everything at uh, cultivate church is by invitation not by obligation and uh, we just want to say thank you so much for being here uh, it's a high honor to have uh, ministered the word of god to you today and as you go from this place be blessed and uh, live for the glory of god thank you so much for being here you're you're free to go